I think sometimes that what I most wish to say to the world were what I most needed to hear. And there is I would say almost an exponentially increasing intimacy to, as we say, reach down inside and say what you need to say. I've spent the better part of my life attempting to do that, attempting to do just that. And I say this because I have learned, as I suspect I always knew, that everybody has a voice. Everybody has things they need to say. People, families have things that need to be said. But the most holy and sacrosanct relationship is what you need to say, irrespective of whether or not anyone else is listening. There's a, a great power in that. There's a great power in that that is in life. And a great power in life that is in the ability, the willingness, the attempt to say, to tell ourselves what we need to say. And um, the vocal traditions that weave their way weave their way, sound by sound, syllable by syllable, wind by rain, by east by west, winter and summer, have grown just like the nature around us has grown. And its power cannot be adequately measured or fathomed. In some cases what we have to say to one another is hard to decipher. If we listen to the world, and though I do not wish it for you, if you listen to your own families, you will hear as much in what is said as in what is not said, and as much in what is said as how it is said, and to whom, and by whom, and why, and under what circumstances, and whether or not included in the circumstances, adequate provision is made as to the needs and feelings of everyone concerned, not the least being their ability to voice how they feel and what they need to say to themselves, to the world, to others, upon whom their entire safety might depend. So by all means, let your children do this. Let your children speak. Let your children express themselves. Let them cry, let them be stubborn, let them sit, let them scowl, let them cry, and sit with them, stand with them, be with them, as they try to figure out what they need to say. Because a child's mind doesn't feel everything that you might feel, and indeed everything that their mind is sustaining in a given moment. And they do not always know what to say, or even how they feel. But their entire body is lighting up with their fully formed sensitivities and sensibilities to and about the world, themselves, their relationships, their sense of safety, their sense of strength and power, their sense of purpose, freedom. Because... I'm going to say that there is a direct correlation between how well or not we attend to the living being of our own children and how well we attend to one another through the medium of the world. And if you weren't heard and indelible impressions become propensities, there is still at any time, the choice. 
even if there isn't the habit or even the sliver of ability, there is the choice to listen even to that which you most are averse to listening to, especially if it's people close around you, close in proximity, people you walk by, for people close to your life, people, if they're not close, members of your blood, of your family. And it doesn't mean you have to pick up the phone today because, believe it or not, most people, whether or not they feel they have a voice, are extremely vocal and extremely articulate. Our body, our mind, every current of every nerve of our body is a light with communication. There is no excuse that somebody didn't say or somebody didn't put it into words. As helpful as that can be at times, people are telegraphing everything all the time. It doesn't require them to use new words. It requires you to use new ears and new eyes. And one of the things that give that to us is using our voice, even if it means admitting that by no fault of ours, no choice in some afterlife, no karma, we happen to be placed in circumstances at any time in our life, and certainly when we were children, where the people around us, upon whom our lives depended for one reason or another, could not make adequate provision for our safety and our freedom of motion and of feeling and of our voice. doesn't matter if it seems difficult. <laughs> doesn't matter if you feel like a difficult person or you, maybe you shouldn't expect people to attend to your every need. It doesn't matter if you feel that it hasn't been achieved. Then you need to give that a voice. And if you give that a voice by whatever scale that means for you. How many people, who, could anyone, did anyone make adequate provision? This gives you new eyes and this gives you new ears. And you can use them however you like. There's no need to jeopardize comfort or safety, just people have a pretty good set of lungs. They've got a pretty good way of talking. And what's really important if I had nothing else to share with any other human being, what's really important is what you have to say. It doesn't matter if anyone even hears or understands it. Of course it's going to matter, but it doesn't have to matter. It doesn't really matter. It's enough that you tell yourself. Because quite frankly, coming, speaking from experience, it's not always safe to vocalize things. Almost the more you need or feel the need to vocalize them to often very aggressive people. And aggression has a yang component of physically harming property, contracts, distrust, all that kind of stuff, bodies. And a passive aspect of simply tacitly excusing or withholding proportional empathy, understanding or interest to the spoken and unspoken needs and feelings of others within their trust. As human beings, much is made of mind control, MK Ultra, and the conspiracy world. We grew up with at least two minds, maybe more. We live in a world that's sustained a fracture to its sanity, probably many thousands of years ago. And we can treat with this subject as much by looking about what happened and why and when and all those kinds of things as we can look at what's rational and what's not in the world around us and start to make distinctions where many other people have long since ceased to do so. And I make a distinction, among many, that what we grow up thinking that we felt as children or remembering that we felt as children is only one component, in many cases, if not all, of what we actually sustained as children. We take for granted as adults that what's happening around us, however imposing or annoying or violent it may be, is something we can register. Now, as an adult, I went through extreme criminal violence, so I couldn't register that even as an adult. It took me 20 years to really get to the point where I could say I can fathom what happened to my mind and body through uh, domestic violence. It almost makes it sound less to say that it's domestic violence. I think it's the worst violence is the domestic violence. But um, we'll, we'll leave that at that. Um, 
So it can be difficult, but on the main, human beings, uh, adults, on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of have an emotional sense of how they feel. They don't like something, they get angry, they get upset. They're aware, they certainly know their opinion, they know their mind, uh, as far as they can tell, anyway. And um, we take for granted because a child's brain can't actually process emotions. It's not medically, physically possible. And one of the things that happens when children aren't properly accounted for in terms of their native genius, and in a world that has bifurcated the animal of our body from uh, the corporate entity of our mind, from the, uh, the existential uh, autonomous being that is your daily sense of self. And of course there's overlap, because I think a lot of our sense of self is generated by the brain. I have no trouble with a physiological description of our sense of awareness. Um, but none of that precludes um, a celestial nature. And indeed, the celestial nature isn't necessarily separate from our physical nature. They are wholly intertwined, as much as the rays of the sun with all of the living plants and chlorophyll that they're producing. Um, it's one and the same current uh, among many currents, not to say uh, and the same as the current with our blood, of our own thought, our respiration, the air, all of this intimacy that we have with the physical and celestial world. So we don't have the language, really, I think, to, to respect um, all that's going on there. But as adults, we don't necessarily remember all that we felt, even though the body and mind sustained it, as often developmentally. So we have a developmental awareness of our lives, uh, more so than we have a necessarily a completely proportional emotional sense of our lives. Um, in many occasions, certainly if there's been any neglect. So what you remember yourself feeling um, is uh, sometimes overlaps with what maybe you imagine you might have felt if you were there today. Um, but it's fair to say that whatever you sustained and whatever you felt, the worse that you felt, the more likely that you, you could have felt a lot more than you did because it was too much to take. And it becomes particularly developmental. We call that post-traumatic shock. Um, it's a name I don't think that um, fairly encompasses everything that's going on. But you can have like two minds. What you remember thinking, the landscape of your development as an emotional and mental being, and uh, the part of you that is inarticulately disturbed by the world that was routinely um, foisted upon you. And there's a related subject to this that I will deal with in a, a few seconds here. Just some people uh, walking by. Nice people. Um, different, speaking a different language, which is neat. Um, the other side to this is a question I have for the viewer or the listener is, do you think that you can account for all the kinds of coercion that you've experienced? Can you say that you can show with empirical, uh, numerological evidence and logical argument the validity of everything that you believe to be absolutely true? In how many areas of your life do you think it's possible that you consider your opinion or that of others to be the same as fact which it may or may not be true. At best, because somebody else says that it can be proven. It's true. We don't always have time to look into everything, and you build up trusts and with people and institutes, and who wouldn't like to think that those trusts were earned, that you were an adequate arbiter of whether that trust uh, was worthy of you. Um, unfortunately, you and I both know that that trust often... Um, is betrayed. It's not earned as well, and we just don't know enough about the world when we form those trusts. And by the time we did, we were already coerced and neglected a lot. It's sort of Children are cajoled quite a bit. The school system is a whopping example of how children are cajoled out of their comfort zone uh, every day of their lives um, and living their day by somebody else's schedule. You know, you wouldn't ask a baby in the womb to live by the schedule of anyone but the mother's body. And yet, as soon as we get out, 
We are so enthusiastic to make that baby live by every other schedule, but that which is most natural for that baby through the most critical time of its development as a cellular, uh, sexual, or prospectively sexual, emotional, mental, and celestial being. So much so, I think we've just become a nerd to these levels of coercion. I think it just, this hits that part of the mind where it's like, oh yeah, I could see how I might feel bad about that, and there are areas of our life that I think suck, but you can't remember how that, how your body sustained that belief system. Those belief systems inveigled into all of our families for hundreds of generations. Many videos ago, I talked about, you know, considering how difficult a situation we may actually find ourselves in at various points in the middle of our lives, in the middle of history, and wherever else we are. Most of us, I don't think, ever get nearly as much chance as we like to discover the relationship between where we think we are, who we think we are, and who answered those questions for us. And have we adequately answered them for ourselves? I think we're blood connected to the celestial psychology of the cosmos and all of our ancestors. And that I think that at the height and the locus and the lodestone of all knowledge, there is a living temple that is very brain-specific, heart-specific, lung-specific, and how it interlacks in a totally mutually satisfying, wholly reciprocal basis with every single person the moment they're conceived on every level of our lives. And as we get older or maybe even as we get younger, or both, we can enjoy all kinds of what amount to a kind of communion with nature and one another. And none of that precludes necessarily technology and everything else. You can be as creative and open as you like. But the point is, at the end of the day, you're the person who decides what your world needs to look like. You're the person who decides how to make distinctions between your opinion or someone else's in fact. And whether or not you have or even want to make logical empirical arguments about things you believe about evolution, about the motion of the sun or the moon, the distance to the stars, global warming, cancer treatment, vaccines. What happens to the human mind, which I think is kind of a double mind, it's all of it is to some degree schizophrenic. Schiz is like the split. It's like a schism, right? a split in the mind. But a split, like we've seen with the mind and the body, doesn't necessarily mean that something is completely separate. There can simply be a distinction like night and day. Right? Are they really all that different? There's been a change in our orientation to space, but space itself has not changed. The general laws and currents of life have not changed. Even all, all the light goes out of our lives, virtually. The body lives in change. It lives in patterns and currents of growth and transformation, often very, very complete levels of transformation. Indeed, all the transformation I've experienced, a combination of all the elements built up from my body, uh, history, life, the cosmos, and just the situations of my life and people and relationships and where I live and all those kinds of things, the language of transformation has found me on a complete level every day of my life. And particularly so when I'm going through acutely transformative episodes of my life. And in here, in these moments, in those times of my life, I, I become very much more closely acquainted with my voice and myself. And that doesn't mean that any, there's anything wrong with any other part of my life. We just change. We go, we're born many times in our life. Birth is, you know, you can look back and extrapolate from where you are right now, birth was probably a pretty big deal for your mind, right? Who knows? You can, we can bicker about how sentient or conscious we are. The point is, the body is sustaining uh, the effect of causes. That's what our bodies do as sensory organisms, as just a bunch of matter. It sustains in, impressions from, from its environment, and we, we started doing that. You're born, and then as you grow up, and all of a sudden maybe you hear about the birth of a man named Jesus, and the birth of the Son, and you kind of wonder about how they're correlated, and you can get all involved in, in uh, the kinds of uh, speculations of metaphysics, and human history, and psychology, and cults like Christianity, and so forth. And there are compelling elements of any number of these things. But you go through your own particular alphabet, your own language. You have your own voice. Your family has its own voice. 
And what do we say about people who engage in recreational activities or recreational drugs and things like that? Anything, any person, if it absorbs your life so much that you cease to take care of yourself, and I would add, make distinctions between what you'd like to believe, true or not, and empirical or objective fact, then I think it becomes to be quite necessary that we ask ourselves, or those people ask themselves, whether or not um, they're losing something that if they were in a clearer state of mind, they actually would not choose to lose. And society around us is built up of enormous amount of loss in that and many other senses. It's built up of, of things that we've lost in ways that we've coped with that, the ways that we've learned to endure it. In every generation, children are brought up learning Right? We want our children to learn about all kinds of wonderful things. They're learning to endure us. They're learning to endure the world. And they're very, very good at it. And they get rewarded in many occasions for doing that. And they get punished if they don't do that in the way their family or a given part of society likes. And I haven't met a single human being who hasn't experienced that acutely in their lives at one time or another. Why, why do people give their souls to religion? Why would someone... Patricia Steer is a prominent person in the Flat Earth cult that's been going strong for about three years now. Not once. In fact, she openly admits that she can't give any logical, empirical evidence in and of herself to convince me or anyone that the Earth is, is flat and that it should be considered a fact. She simply says that it is. That should trouble people, not, not even if you're just in that cult, in any cult. How many times do any of us do that? Because it's expedient to take us someplace we want to go and we need to do some other things. It's like a vehicle, right? Conflating opinion or what you'd like to believe with a fact is like a vehicle. It takes you places. It's uh, almost like a drug. In fact, maybe that's what Marx said when he said the religion is the opiate of the masses. It's, it's enthralling. You know, I think on some level it's like what some very rich people in the world probably feel when they first you know, pay to watch a snuff film or get given some sort of underage prostitute to deflower, probably on some kind of drug, speed, cocaine, or some kind of combination. Right, what a rush that must be. And I think we experience a rush growing up, not just from undue amount of pain and neglect, but also the rush of, believe it or not, in the adult world, Things that we would consider things that are just interesting stories can become absolutely real. And very important people take this very seriously. And they build up our whole lives around it. They, they take care of the temple called all that human beings know, all that sh should they should rely on, and all whom they should trust, and all whom they shouldn't trust, including themselves. How many people can give empirical, num numerological and logical evidence that their president or prime minister or king or queen have a legitimate right to occupy a certain level of influence over the world around them. And then anyone else around them, any institution, how do you know that? Faith, right? Everyone else does. It looks like it has some utility, but utility does not confer legitimacy. To what end do I make, do I ask these questions, these to what end do we examine something better left unexamined? Um, because human beings are taught not to think and they're taught not to examine how much their faith is if you buy supplements from the store, you've got the most expensive piss there is. If you buy poisons in the supermarket, that's the most unenjoyable way to die that I can imagine. Yeah, your body runs down, eating, digestion, everything, free radicals, but do you really want to crank that up like 10 notches for your body by eating processed food every day? The toxins that humans take in all the time is amazing. It's almost awe-inspiring 
how much we go about the business of injecting every kind of poison into our air, water, food supply, and even directly into the blood of our own young. All, on some level, by usually hundreds of millions of people, so that we can be safe and secure and keep, keep the wolves from the front door. The seraphim in the garden that are, you know, the Coke and Pepsi, the Microsoft and Apple, the Republicans and Democrats of the world, the cosmology and string theory and quantum physics and uh, particle accelerators, telescopes and images of deep space and lunar landings and Martian landings. It's all dazzling array, very dazzling. How much uh, do you know that any of those things have happened or even could happen? Trust, faith. And even if you trust all those people, can you trust yourself? In what areas of your life would you not use that level of faith? Would you close your eyes while driving? Um, Would you walk across the road, or would you send a three-year-old across the road and have faith that they'd make it? What kind of areas of your life would you not use that level of faith? Would you... Go down a road, blindfolded in a city you've never been, accept some food in one of your hands and begin to scarf it down. Because someone sidled up beside you and said, they're the doctor and guru of all eating, and if you can eat this on faith, you will be a better person. And we're experiencing a real bad disease where people aren't eating what I tell them to. Maybe they've impersonated... Or actually were the incarnation of someone whose book you'd read or whose class you'd taken. So how many how many areas of life would we not employ that level of faith? It's very seductive, the faith around. It's a casino. You ever been in a casino and they pump the oxygen in and you've got all these bright lights and the allure of this 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 one of the holy substances of the world, money next to oil. Right? Power is like a substance. But all wealth comes from people. And depending on how well you think, it's possible to give much more power than you absolutely need to to all the kinds of psychological machinery, to say nothing of the physical tanks rolling over people, whose sole purpose is to dazzle and baffle the human mind into submission. they got a Jesus that that through the money changers out of the temple who asks you, maybe someone put words into his mouth, to give you his, your soul, to give him your soul. And an act so important, the axis mundi of all creation, that essentially confers an angelic status upon all the people who actually tortured and killed him, Jesus Christ. And sets a precedent that anyone tortured who happens to retain any kind of true humanity, nay, divinity, is experiencing the most important creative act in the world. It's almost like an orgasm. An orgasm of creation in the most torturous and humiliating thing. Now, ask yourself, how many billions of people believe that, go through their entire day, and devote whatever else is going on in their life, their highest level of communion? And any pleasure they're allowed to have after that to to that story and to stories like it, including evolution and global warming and cancer research for some cure, although any doctor has any mandate to cure you of anything. Think about the level of faith and devotion. Do you think anybody benefits from that? Do you benefit from that? And, of course, the answer is twofold. To some degree, people do benefit from doing that, and to many degrees, they don't. And a lot of that has to do with how they feel and how they might have felt as a kid if they had the ability to feel the extent of the stress imposed upon them and neglect. Now, whatever neglect we've suffered, whatever's happened to our mind, our choices, you can reject all of that. You can, you can be agnostic of everything. No one can arrest you for that. Be an agnostic of everything you hear and everything you see. Because it's not a revolution. It's not going to be another war. It's not going to be anything. And there are lots of great things out there. And as great as they are, they're never going to be the thing. The thing 
that if you do this thing, everything else will, will gain a million times more value that is helpful to everyone in the world, be it a concert, a group, some words, an event, just people doing nice things, a smile on the street, whatever it is. And that is taking stock of the space inside our head and taking control of it by starting to make a distinction between what we think we know, what we actually know, what we'd like to believe, and what freedom of consideration and thought and imagination we might have if we make distinctions of all the things we have in our mind that we think are real, whether or not we can actually show that they're real, whether or not this, this confidence in these things in our higher abstract faculties, our religious imagination, and our ultimate communion with our ancestors and the celestial world within and around us. The things in there are only there because we've put our faith in something or someone that these things should be there. People like to build their own homes. They fantasize about having the most amazing mansion. You have the most amazing mansion in your own mind and your celestial biology. But it's been occupied by mercenary ideas, predatory mercenary ideas, that have a life of their own and gain the animation daily, formally and informally, of literally every single person in the world in the name of whatever bank, church, or temple they give most of their labor to, and even their children, killing and dying on behalf of the most inimical forces to their life, as though any objection to this is the most inimical thing to their freedom. Think about the mind you're living around. You get one, at least for the duration here, and it will change. And, uh, but while you're, you're on this earth, you know, if you've ever wanted the nicest castle, you have one, you know, use it. There's a great pleasure in believing things we don't necessarily fully prove. And if we can't prove them, it doesn't mean that they're wrong, and it doesn't mean there's not enormous benefit in speculating about all kinds of stuff. And make dressing up the temple of your, your cosmogony. Um, but when we fail to make a distinction between what we'd like to believe and what we can objectively prove, here we trespass upon something, pleasurable as it is, that sustains a loss in our value, of life in our capacity to make an adequate provision for other people in the vast network of communication, sharing, and culture that we all depend upon, whether we like it or not. You want to make a vote, you want to do something for the environment, clean up your mind, 